Y'all can go. Y'all can go. I appreciate it. Can you give this band a, and choir a wonderful hand? There is somebody in this room today. You've been lied on. You've been lied to. People been speaking about you. People been talking junk behind your back. People been saying things about you. God wants to tell you today that you are enough. Look at your neighbor and tell them you are enough. Say it like you mean it. You are enough. You are enough. Look back at him and say, I am enough. I am enough. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is stirring. God is stirring. Hallelujah. 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 There is a shout in this atmosphere. There is a shout stirring in this atmosphere. There is a shout stirring and somebody needs to shout, I am enough. Somebody needs to shout and declare that I am enough. I don't know who told you different, but somebody needs to shout, I am enough. Hallelujah. The Bible says in Jeremiah 1 verse 5, in the message translation, it says, Before I shaped you in the womb, I knew all about you. Get that in your spirit. You see, sometimes the devil will lie to you and tell you, God didn't know you. God don't know you. God ain't studying you. Oh, baby, you got it twisted. He's been studying you before you even came to be. And he says, before you saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you. Not just plans. See, there's a difference between plans and holy plans. When it's holy plans, that means your days are marked by him. A prophet to the nations. That's what I had in mind for you. That's what I had in mind for you. What do you have in mind for yourself? What, what is it in your mind that you've been telling yourself about you? Because God knows what he has in mind for you, right? He, he, he has a plan. He has something for you. He has something that he alone put on the inside of you that only him can release it. But he needs our, um, he needs our cooperation. And the problem is with Christian folk, we tend to think, God, I don't need you right now. We tend to think we can continue to walk this journey without him. The Bible says, Pastor referenced it earlier, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's never going to leave you or forsake you, but you can forsake him and leave him. Yeah. I don't know why I put this down. I needed it in my hand. So, in your weakest moments, your enemy's weapon of choice is to try and discredit your destiny. He's a master at that. And you see, in these last days, Satan will intensify corporately by attacking you individually. That's why there's so much uproar between this group and that group and this party and that party and this person and that person. Just because you look different than me and somebody else did something that looks like you, they hurt me, I'm going to hurt you even though you didn't hurt me because somebody that looked like you hurt me. That's the way the enemy is going to attack in these last days. He's going to attack us individually by putting junk in our mind and tells us that everybody that looks different from us is the enemy. And by doing that with more and more people, then his, his agenda will intensify corporately. Because see, he's a master at trying to sabotage your salvation. He's a master at that. He's a master at trying to choke your character. He wants you to slip up. He wants you to do something that will cause you to fall back, cause you to backslide. That's what he wants from you. He wants you to do that. But Christianity is not perfection. It's progress. Hear me. Christianity is perfection. Or, or it's not perfection. It's progress. God never required us to be perfect. He required us to progress. 
What did Paul say? I press toward the mark is what he says. That word press in the original Greek is a word called dioku, meaning to pursue. If you're pursuing something, that means you ain't get there yet, right? So when we sit here, we have to be very careful because there's a generation of, of, of people right now that feel so condemned instead of convicted. That's why they're not here. You didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. There are people outside of this building right now that they've been so condemned by people up here in churches all over the world or people that stopped them at the water cooler and see that they got a tattoo so they want to condemn them because Christianity is not perfection, it's progress. I press toward the mark. I'm pressing toward the mark. I am on a journey. Now, that doesn't give you an excuse to just live how you want to live. There's a difference. There's a difference. You see, when the Holy Spirit is moving and operating, when you're speaking to somebody, it releases conviction. When the flesh is speaking to somebody else's flesh, that's, con that's condemnation. And God doesn't, God doesn't want that. So when you speak from the place of the Holy Spirit releasing on the inside of you, then you can teach somebody, hey, this is a journey. This is progress. But when the Holy Spirit is speaking through you, the Bible says to preach truth in love. If you're preaching truth in love, they'll get convicted. Because that's what you want. You want growth. You don't want stagnancy. But you also don't want condemnation. To beat somebody up over the head and say, oh, you should be living this way. And if you don't live this way, you're evil. No, that's not biblical. That's not biblical. So let's jump into the main text today. It's Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. So if you read the book of Zechariah, it goes right along with what pastors have been teaching us about the last days. The first two books, actually really the whole, the whole book is talking about end, end times end time situations, um, what's going on, what's going to happen with Jerusalem, what's going, what's, going, what's going to happen with the people of God. This particular scripture is for me and you. I believe when the Lord wrote Zechariah chapter 3, he thought about us right here. I forgot to mention, you know what day it is, right? You know what day it is, right? It is August 9th. 2020 we are birthing something in this season I dare you this week I told you already that shout in you it needs to be birthed it needs to be birthed in order for something to be birthed corporately it needs to be birthed individually that's free let's move on Zechariah chapter 3 so he says this it says, Zechariah says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angels. I need to give y'all a visual of this, all right? So, Asher, come help me. Hank, come help me. Where's Larry? Tim, come help me. There you go. Grab that rule for me, Hank. All right, so I, let's get this scene in heaven really quickly, all right? So, Larry is Joshua, the high priest. Come over here, Larry. Turn and face. God, God, God the Father. Put, put the robe down, Hank. Put the robe down. Hank is God the Father. Miss Marilyn, no jokes. No jokes. Come over here. <laughs> you face him. Tim is Satan. No jokes. No jokes. No jokes. He just happened to be dressed in all black today. And I was like, Tim, you're going to help me today. All right. Right there. And then Asher is the angel of the Lord standing on the right side of God the Father. So I don't know about y'all, 
but my angel's huge. And right now, Ash is the tallest dude in this church, so he, he, it's him. So, I want you to get this picture. The Bible says Joshua the high priest was standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, I know what you may be thinking. What, this, what has he got to do with me? You see, some of us, the Bible says Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Some of us, though we know who Jesus is, we've come in with filthy, filthy rags on. And the problem is, <laughs> the problem is, we've ar we already know we have self-doubt. We have self-guilt because we come in here like this and then the enemy does this. Go ahead, Tim. He says, the Bible says, the Bible says Satan stood there and was opposing him. So he started accusing him. He was already dirty as it was. He already came in. Some of y'all already came in here feeling like this before the marks. And when you come in here ready to worship, the enemy starts to, he starts to say, man, you shouldn't be worshiping. What you doing? Don't you know what you did last night? You was at the club at 2 a.m. You was smoking weed. 20 years ago, you had that affair. He starts bringing up old stuff. You thought you left it in the past, and he's just saying, nah, uh-uh, not me. I ain't going to let you forget nothing, nothing. You're not going to forget anything, anything. And he keeps going and going and going until the Lord says this, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. As soon as he says that, as, watch this, as soon as he says that, he has to stop. You didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. He has to stop at the word. <laughs> he has to stop at the word. When was the last time you rebuked this? I mean, rebuked the Satan. When was the last time you rebuked the devil? When was the last time you opened up your mouth and said, Satan, I rebuke you in the name of the Lord. Some of us have been going through trauma and turmoil for far too long. And we would just open up our mouth and say, Satan, I rebuke you. Somebody shout, I am enough. So what he's saying is, Satan, I rebuke you. I want you to notice something. After he says, Satan, I rebuke you, we never hear from Satan again. That should be a word for somebody. The Bible says, resist the devil. And he will flee. Not might, not should, not could. He said he will flee. When you choose to resist the devil, you are telling him your time is up in this moment. Leave. And I want you to catch something else here. It says, Joshua was standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at the right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, most Theologians believe in the Old Testament, anytime it says the angel of the Lord, it was Jesus pre-incarnate. So where, does, where is Jesus' place right now? At the right hand of the Father. The angel of the Lord said, the Lord rebuke you. You have an advocate standing at the right hand of the Father. And notice how Satan was standing at his right hand. The right hand is authority. The enemy has been trying to steal our authority for far too long. The enemy has been trying to rob you of your peace for far too long. So he purposely stands on your right side and tries to accuse you. Imagine if we would recognize that, turn to our right and say, yo, I'm done with you. Leave. When we do that, we are mimicking the Father. We are, see, we, are, we are doing what the Father told us to do. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.1, imitate God as their children. What did God do? He put him at his right hand. So who needs to be at your right hand? The angel of the Lord. Angel of the Lord, go stand next to him. Where's my clicker? I'm all out of order. 
Then it says this. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So you see, when God speaks, things change, right? Things change, yeah. right? Yeah. So he says, he says to those around him, so since we ain't got a group of people around here, this filthy garment that you came in with, the doubts, the fears, the sins, the things of your past, he says, take away the filthy garments. Go ahead and tear that off. Get this visual. He says, take it away. When you come into the presence of the Lord, and you come in with the filthy garments, God says to you, because of your faithfulness to even show up, even though you knew you were living in sin, even, even though you knew you did something wrong that you shouldn't have done, even when you've messed up, even when you've, maybe, maybe you and your wife had an argument on the way to church, and you walked in here with those filthy garments on, God says to you, I have removed your iniquity. I have removed your sin. And then he says this. He says, <laughs> I will clothe you. Somebody get that in your spirit. No matter what you've done, no matter the pain you've lived through, no matter the hurt that you've faced, no matter your past, no matter your pain, no matter your problems, he said he will clothe you with rich 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 there's nothing about God that's poor <laughs> there's nothing about God that's poor there's nothing about God that's broke he said he will clothe you with rich robes another place in the Bible says I, I believe it's Isaiah 61 10 it says I will clothe you with the robe of righteousness no matter your iniquity no matter your sin no matter the journey that you're still on. Because nobody, nobody in here has gotten there yet. We won't get there until we see him. Again, that doesn't excuse. Please hear me. Please hear me. Because we have one extreme or the other. Do what you want to do. Oh, I'm covered by grace. Don't do nothing. You're going to hell. No, it don't work that way. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible also says our righteousness is as filthy rags. The only way we can become righteous is by putting on the robe of righteousness. So that is how we need to live. That is how we need to embrace that I am enough. We are not enough because of the work that we do. We are enough because of the work that he did. He did the work. I didn't do it. Thank you, guys. Give these guys a hand. Think about something for a minute. Remember the story of Jacob? The Bible says he wrestled with God all night. And in order for God to free himself from Jacob's grip, he had to touch the hip and took his socket out of place. Jacob had to walk with a limp and with a crutch. What did Jesus say? Take up your cross and follow me. If you see crutches back in the day, they weren't like the crutches that we use now with the nice special padding on it. They were shaped like what? They were shaped like a cross. Imagine when Jesus changes your walk so much that you have to depend on When he says to take up your cross and follow him, he is literally saying, take it up as a crutch and walk this journey with me. You ain't going to never walk the same again because you are now leaning. You are now leaning on the crutch. Somebody shout, I am enough. Somebody shout, I am enough. There is a crutch that the Lord wants you to lean on. 
Because remember, Christianity is not perfection, it's progress. And the reason why it's progress is, is because he told you to take up your cross and follow him. So when you take up the cross and you're leaning on the cross, your whole dependency, your whole livelihood, how you walk, how you talk, how you live, is based off of that crutch. It's based off the crutch. So Joshua represented the priesthood. Now I heard what you said, but Tony, I'm not a priest. Are you sure? My Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 9, that I am a chosen people. I am a royal priesthood. I am a holy nation. Just because you're not up here with a microphone in your hand doesn't mean you're, that you're not a priest. You're a priest on your job. You're a priest in your home. Husbands, you are the priest of your home. Let me say that again. Husbands, you are the priest of your home. You better start acting like it. Satan will always accuse those who are available. When you step in here, this is his greatest playground. Yes, sir. This is his greatest playground because he knows what you did during the week. <laughs> he knows what you did. But I got great news. So does God. He will always accuse you when you make yourself available in God's presence. But the Lord will always advocate for the available. Always, always, always. When you choose to stand, when you choose to shout, when you choose to walk in your God-given authority, no matter what the enemy throws at you, no matter what the enemy accuses you of, he will always advocate for you because his love is that sweet. His love is that great. Amen? It also says in that scripture that he is a brand plucked by the fire. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that screams to me imperfect. That screams to me unclean. Because see, when he says you're a brand plucked by the fire, that means he's taking you just as you are. He didn't take the wood that has not been burned yet. He took it out of the fire. He took it out of the turmoil. He took it out of the pain. And he said, I still want to use that. Some of you in this room today, you feel like a brand plucked by the fire and feel like you're not worthy of being used by God. You feel like God can't use you in any way. I submit to you today, you are a brand plucked by the fire. And he, his strength is made perfect in your weakness. You see, the charred places of your past are the very foundation that God will rebuild, restore, and renew your life on. you got to hear that, guys. you got to hear what God wants to do. He wants to pluck you out of that situation. He wants to pluck you out of your sin. He wants to pluck you out of those things that caused you to be bound all these years. He is going to pluck you out and rebuild your life on it. Because God can use anyone. Why can't it be you? Why can't it be you? Your imperfections create a space for the perfect one to work in you. You see, there's a, there's a song um, some of the guys ministered to a few years ago called God's Masterpiece. And in the song, they're mimicking the, mom, the, the, you know, the motions of somebody chiseling. Pop, 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 pop. Pop, 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 pop. And it's God chiseling away your imperfections. He's pruning away those things. So that way, when you are ready for him, to be, for him to use you, you are perfect, needing nothing. God is chiseling away some things in this season. Because, about, because for what he's about to release in the earth realm, he needs some people that have already been worked on. You didn't hear me. There are some things in the next, let's say the rest of this year. He's going to start chiseling away at you. He's going to start pruning away at you because the assignment that you're about to step into requires you to be at your best. You can't be at your best if you're hanging on to stuff. Hebrews 12 says, drop every weight, everything that would try to entangle you. How can you run when you're weighted down by sin? You didn't hear me. You can't run the race if you got stuff tripping you up. So God needs to start chiseling away at your imperfections because he's perfect. Only something that's perfect can, 
can, can, can, can, can heal something that's imperfect. Notice, notice with things that, that cause practice, right? You know, you hear it say, uh, you hear us say it often. Doctors only practice. They're practicing medicine. But if you will recognize and receive that the perfect one is the thing that can heal your imperfection. So if you're sick, not saying don't go to a doctor. Please hear me. Please hear me. But why would you ever go to a doctor before going to the author and finisher of your faith? Why is it when you have zero dollars in your bank account, you rather run to the bank instead of going to the perfect one that can provide? You see, there's imperfections in us. So he's got a chisel. Pop, 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 pop. Pop, 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 pop. And it hurts. It hurts. It hurts to be chiseled. It hurts to be pruned. It hurts. You know, in Luke chapter 18, we read of a man that was a tax collector. And we read of another man who was a Pharisee. The man who thought that he was righteous, he walks up and says, Lord, I thank you. That I ain't like these other heathens. I ain't like these other sinners. Some of us, we need to learn to stop looking down our big old nose at other people. We better learn that real quick. Some of us are real guilty of trying to take out that toothpick in somebody else's eye. And we got a big old telephone pole in our own. The Bible says to, be, to, to, to judge not lest you be judged. So he says this, God, I thank you that I'm not like this joker over here. He, I ain't like him. He's a sinner. He, 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 he doing all crazy stuff. The man that was a tax collector, the Bible says he couldn't even look in the direction of God. And the Bible says he tore his clothes and he beat his breast and he said, God, help me. Have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. You see, when you come in here, when you come in here, when you're in your prayer closet, when you're driving down the road, I dare you. I dare you, with all the courage in your heart, with all the conviction in your heart, to say, God, help me. I'm a sinner. I need your mercy. I need your grace. If nobody else don't need it, God, I need it. I need it every day, Father God. Every hour, I need you, God. Because when you do that, that's when God says, all right, he's ready. He's ready for me to start the chiseling. He's ready for me to start the pruning. Because pruning is what causes growth. Where is she? Miss Natasha, when you're pruning your trees, what happens? Things grow, right? Things grow. The problem with some Christians is we're not growing. People can't eat off your tree because you ain't grown nothing in 20 years. Because you haven't submitted yourself under the mighty hand of God. When you get pruned, you can grow something so that somebody else can pluck it off your tree and eat. And you can be a witness and a testimony to somebody else. That is the calling of a Christian. That is the calling of a disciple. That is the calling of somebody that believes who God is and lives that way. Submit yourself to pruning so when something grows, somebody else can take off and eat and they can grow too. Because what happens on a tree? What is on the inside of that fruit? Seeds. There are seeds on the inside of your fruit that somebody else needs to plant in their lives so that they can grow up and be somebody else too. Amen? His presence is a place of conviction and comfort, not a place of condemnation and criticism. When you come in an atmosphere like this and the Holy Spirit is moving, nobody will have to tell you about what you were doing wrong. The Holy Spirit will. He'll check you real quick. He'll check you real quick. But if you ever come in this place and you feel condemnation, that's not of God. Because Romans 8.1 says... Therefore, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So in his presence, 
is conviction, yes, but also comfort. Right. Somebody shout, I am enough. I am. Say it like you mean it, I am enough. I am enough. What represented you must be removed. What, represent, what you used to be has to get out of the way for God to do something new. It says in verse 4 of that same chapter, Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity. Who you were is not who you will be. Get that in your spirit. Who you used to be will not be who you are right now. The Bible says, The old has passed away. All things, not some things, not a little thing, all, all becomes brand new when you step into his presence. Colossians 3, 9 and 10. I found this little nugget in scripture. This is pretty cool. It says, you're done with that old life. It's like a filthy set of ill-fitting clothes you stripped off and put in the fire. You see, when the ghost gets to moving on the inside of you, those old clothes that you used to wear when you were out there in the world, they start to feel a little funny. They start to itch. They start to scratch. They start to feel a little weird because they don't fit you anymore. You know, when I was in high school, my clothes used to be super baggy. I wore like triple XL shirts and size 40 waist pants. I mean, just baggy, baggy clothes. And now, when those same people that I went to school with see me now, they don't just recognize that my outer appearance is different. They sense that something is different on the inside of me. <laughs> now, you're dressed in a new wardrobe. Every item of your new way of life is custom made by the creator with his label on it. Some of y'all, man, I can only wear Michael Kors. You know, some of y'all, y'all can only wear whatever brand. This says the clothes that he's putting on you, it's got his custom label on it. So when somebody lifts up your shirt back and, and it says, man, what you got on? Man, I got the creator of the universe on me. <laughs> Come on, somebody. All the old fashions are now obsolete. All the old stuff you used to struggle with, they no longer matter. Because he has given you a, 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 a designer label that money can't buy. Money can't buy it. Righteous robes are for the redeemed. We got any redeemed folk in the house? Oh, come on. That was terrible. We got any redeemed folk in the house? I told you your shout releases a shift. That was a good chance for you to shout just now. Are there any redeemed folk in the house? That's better. And I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. Your right, stamp, your right standing was established when you stood in his presence. You see, you can't stand in the presence of God if your heart isn't right. Because in his presence is only holiness. Yeah. So the filthy garments that you have on, you're either going to be struck dead or he's going to remove it. Because <laughs> nothing unholy can stand in his presence. So when you're in his presence here, God is going to remove those filthy garments. He's going to strip it off of you and say, I removed your iniquity. Now you can stand in my presence. Now you can believe in my presence. Now you can ask for anything in my presence. The rest of Colossians 3, 12 through 14 says, So chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God has picked out for you. That means you have a choice. Every day you wake up, you have a choice. Are you going to pick up the old clothes? Are you going to pick up the anger? Are you going to pick up the pornography? Are you going to put, are you going to pick, come on somebody, are you going to pick up the adultery? Are you going to pick up those old clothes that you used to wear that you used to be recognized by? Or are you going to dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you? You see, there is, a, there is such a thing as self-condemnation, right? 
we can condemn ourselves. When we know we've done something wrong, we know. You know when you've done something wrong. The difference is, when you are in Christ, you know that condemnation did, did not come from him. So when you chose, maybe one day you had a bad day and you chose to pick up the old clothes. The Bible says his mercies are what? New each morning. So the next day, I advise you the next day to take them clothes out in the back and burn them. Burn them. Because when you choose to burn something that is in your past, though the smell may still be there, eventually that, that, that fresh aroma, that heavenly aroma will get on you. Because now you're wearing the wardrobe God has picked out for you. And it says compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline. Be even-tempered, content with second place. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Content with second place. What you mean, Lord? You mean to tell me I, 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 I got to be okay with not coming in first? I'm speaking to somebody. Some of y'all competitive folk. You know I can never come in second. The devil is a lie. I ain't never going to come in second. Listen. Understand something. When God is on his throne, he's always first. You didn't hear me. When God is your priority, he's always first. Matter of fact, you better not do anything without him being first. Quick to forgive an offense. Boy, you mean I got to forgive that person? I don't really like them. They hurt me 2,800 years ago, and I still got to hold on to it. <laughs> Stepping on toes. It's all right. Them toes will heal. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. You mean to tell me I can say forgiveness, but I really got to live forgive? See, it's one thing to just say, brother, I forgive you, and you still talking about them behind their back. Completely, the Bible says, completely forgive in your heart, too, not just out of your mouth. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. Wear love. Wear love on Facebook. Wear love on social media. Wear love at the grocery store. Wear love. We got too much hate already as it is. Hate is a natural, it, it's natural to hate because we're all selfish. Did I just say that? We're all selfish, so it's easy to hate. It takes work to love. And if he was willing to love your sorry self, you can love somebody else. And the Bible says, it's your basic, all-purpose garment. Never be without it. Remember them old, old commercial, was it Visa or MasterCard? They said, never leave home without it. American Express, sorry. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. American Express says, never leave home without it. Don't leave without love. Some of y'all forget your phone, and you 30 miles away, you'll turn right back around and go get that phone. But when you forgot love on the kitchen counter, you say, oh, you know, I can live without it today. No, you can't. Take it with you. Redemption graduates you to responsibility. Zechariah 3.6 says, And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua. He admonished Joshua. God will allow you to rule and reign in places that you couldn't with your old garments. You see, when you are in college, high school, whatever, you get what? A cap and gown, right, when it's time to graduate? When you get that cap and gown, though, there's some responsibility that is attached to it. The four years of college that you just went through, when you walked across that stage, you have now gained an extra responsibility as a college graduate. When the Lord puts the righteous robes on you, you step into a new level of responsibility. You have a responsibility to live right. John 8, 31, 32 says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word... And you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You see, knowledge puts a demand on your life. Now that you know the truth, 
It's your responsibility to live free. You didn't hear me. There is a certain knowledge that God has deposited on the inside of us now because we know what the truth is. You know what the truth is. Live right. Treat people right. You know that now. Now you got to go do it. And if you don't do it, you are shirking your responsibility. All the shouting has stopped. I guess I, 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 done, I done stepped in your breakfast, huh? And I got quiet on me. Consistency in your actions gives you access. Zechariah 3, 7 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my command, then you shall also judge my house, and likewise have charge over my courts. I will give you places to walk among these who stand here. You see, now that you now have a new responsibility, now that you have the robes of righteousness, now that he has taken the iniquity away from you, now you can come to the throne anytime you want to. He says it. He says, now I will give you a place to walk among these who are standing here. Who are these? The heavenly hosts, the heavenly witnesses. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, it says, so now we come freely and boldly to where love is enthroned to receive mercy's kiss and discover the grace we urgently need to strengthen us in our time of weakness. Now that you have access to the throne and you know your responsibility, now you can walk in the heavenly realm. Now you can walk with the Holy Spirit leading and guiding you into all truth. Now you can approach the throne anytime you have a need. Better yet, you can approach the throne just to worship him. When was the last time you just approached the throne just to worship? When's the last time you've done that? Because we're always bringing needs to him, which is not a bad thing. Please hear me. You, you, he wants you to bring your needs. But sometimes it'd be nice to just go freely and boldly to where he is enthroned and just say, God, I just want to step in here today and say, I love you. I worship you. I thank you for what you're doing in my life. I thank you for what you've done for me. I thank you how you healed me. I thank you how you set me free. I thank you how you delivered me. Come on, somebody. We have that access now. Because of our consistency. That's a dirty word. Nobody likes that word consistent. Because it's hard to be consistent. It's hard to, God, you mean I got to do this every day? God, you mean I, you know, you I got to take up this cross every day? I don't want to take up the cross today. Well, just go ahead and limp about your business. But if you got the crutch, what did I say earlier? You can walk and do what God has called you to do. I need to move. Your choices reveal your company. Zechariah 3, 8 says, Hear, O Joshua, the high priests, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign, for behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. When you have a corporate anointing, as we do here, you are ushering in the branch. That's why in the last days, churches are going to have to unite because the branch needs to be ushered in. The branch is Jesus, by the way. If y'all didn't know that, I'm sorry. The branch is Jesus. And in order for him to come back, we're going to have to start getting in position. What does he say here? He says, Joshua the high priest, you and your companions who are all before you. As I said earlier, there will be such a deluge in this place that the other boats around us in this city and in this region, when they hear the shout, they will start to draw closer. And then true unity can happen. And when true unity happens, the branch will come. And, oh, God, we need the branch. We need the branch. You can't, be, you can't operate in obedience and be surrounded by opposing people. Watch your circle. Not everybody in your circle is in your corner. Mm. Not everybody in your circle is in your corner. There are some people that you associate with that when you run into an issue, they ain't got your back. He says, you and your companions. A companion should be somebody you can trust in the corner. Matthew 18, 20 says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. When I join my faith with somebody, we instantly become companions, even if I don't know them. 
because the faith on the inside of them taps into my faith, which releases him to say, okay, I got an assignment. Some of us, again, I'm not discounting what you do in your prayer closet by yourself, but there's something different about corporate worship. There is something different about joining your faith with somebody in an atmosphere like this where he has no choice but to say, my kids need me. And he steps in and he says, I am with you right there. He is coming to reveal himself based off of your testimony. Zechariah 3, 9 and 10 says, For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon the stone are seven eyes. Somebody say completion. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. His complete work in your life will compel others to receive his redemptive work. You see, once Joshua started walking, walking in his authority, he got the iniquity stripped of him. Now his companions are also walking in that same anointing. Because God did that complete work in them, he's going to start completing some things in others. So there are relationships around you that you've been praying for, you've been believing for, waiting for them to get saved. God says it's time to start releasing the completing work of the Holy Spirit. Salvation is going to come. Revival is going to come. Breakthrough is going to come. Change is going to come. Because now it's, it, it, it's complete. It's complete. Philippians 1.27 says, whatever happens, keep living your lives based on the reality of the gospel of Christ, which reveals him to others. Nothing can separate you. 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 Not your past, not your pain, not your problems from God's promise. Somebody needs to get that in your spirit. Get it in your belly today. Because, see, some of us have dealt with trauma. Some of us have dealt with so much pain and suffering that sometimes we think, God, this problem may even be too big for you. Don't let the devil lie to you like that. There is nothing, no pain that is too great for your great God. You are enough because God is enough. The gifts the abilities, the calling on your life. You got that because he can trust you. I want to pray for you guys today. As I was preparing this message, I, I felt such a burden because there are times when I question, God, God, am I enough? God, am I enough? God, you know what I've done. I felt like the Lord was just reminding me and so I want to remind somebody today the God that is great on the inside of you is greater than that force that may try to come against you you are enough you are enough can we just lift our hands in the room right there Father, we sense your anointing. We sense your power. Father, we ask right now that the power of the Holy Ghost would fill lives right now. Father, if there's anybody in this room today that does not know you, I pray right now over them. If that is you and you do not know who Jesus is, I'm not going to ask you to lift your hands, but I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Father God, Father God I, need you. I need you. Come and change my life. Forgive me of my sins and help me to live the righteous life. Say, Devil, I'm through with you. Get off my back. Get out of my life. 
I belong to Jesus. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. I dare you to shout this week. I dare you to shout this week. I dare you to shout this week. If you don't know what to shout, just shout, I am enough. When you feel the enemy trying to attack you, I dare you to shout in his face, I am enough. Because when you walk in who God has called you to be, you'll start believing, I'm enough. Amen? Would you stand? Thank you so much for being here today at Metro Tab Church. So honored to have you guys. So honored to be in the house with you today. Hopefully that word blessed you. Do remember this Wednesday, we have our small groups, uh, Wild Ladies, as well as Iron Man. If you are a man, I need to see you here at 6.30. If you are a lady, Men, bring your wives, or better yet, women, bring your husbands. So we hope to see you here at 6.30 on Wednesday. God bless you. We love you. Have a great day. Love you guys. Oh, there's nothing better than you.